So last spring when Sarah called me about coming today, I told my wife that uh, there was this girl from Iowa that wanted a farmer from Kentucky to come talk to you guys about growing crops. <laughs> so if you're in Kentucky, if you're a farmer in Kentucky, you think you died and gone to heaven if you're farming in Iowa. So if you guys are surprised about me being here, you're not as surprised as I am. <laughs> So I thought, first of all, uh, I just go through a few slides looking at where we are in Kentucky and looking at our farm, and then I'll tell you a little bit about the group that we put together that's been working on, on tweet research, actually over the last 35 years. But in Kansas, they grow hard red winter wheat. In, in the eastern United States, we grow soft red winter wheat. And the, diff the primary difference being hard wheat rises, Soft wheat doesn't when you bake it. So the soft red winter wheat that we grow in Kentucky is used for biscuits, cookies, crackers, pancake mixes, things that, that you don't really need, need the uh, flour to rise in when you bake with them. So our home farm is located right there where the circle is. We're 50 miles north of Nashville, Tennessee. And this is a, it's just a picture of a wheat plant in Kentucky. One of the issues in growing wheat in Kentucky is we're in a humid area. We get lots of leaf diseases. It's always a challenge to keep to keep our wheat green and where we have the flag wheat green throughout the growing season. Basically, Kentucky has corn, beef, uh, some horses. The area we are, we have silty clay on the soils. One to two percent organic matters on two to six percent slopes. We get quite a bit of rainfall. But we're in a hot area, it evaporates almost as soon as it hits the ground, and we have low organic matter. So it's always a challenge to maintain or to keep our water holding the past in our soils. That means that we're trying to grow corn in June and July when it's hot and dry, typically. Our corn yields in Kentucky are not corn yields in Iowa. So the, really the the best combination of crops as far as generating revenue in Kentucky is the wheat double crop soybean rotation. So in the area that we're in, a typical rotation is you plant corn one year, you harvest it in September, we plant wheat or barley sometimes in, in October, then we harvest that in June, we'll come back with double crop soybeans that will be harvested in October, November of that year. Then we go back to corn the following year. So we get about three. Typical rotation is, is three crops in two years. Our family farm is a sixth generation farm. Uh, started out, with tobacco was a, important, it was the cash crop that actually generated the revenue on our farm for at least the first two or three generations. We don't grow any tobacco at this point, and we've evolved, in, evolved into corn, soybeans, wheat, barley, and rye. I say rye, we're not very good at growing rye, but we still grow some of it. So we're, we try to focus on the, you know, the intensively managed wheat program, and we, we partner with, with our landowners that we, that we lease land from, to hopefully generate long-term leases with people who are interested in, in maintaining their soil quality and sustainability. So this is a, just a typical sprayer we use to hot dress and, and spray pesticides with. This just sort of gives you a, a shot of, the, of a typical, we're planting corn into soybean and wheat stubble there you can see where the row cleaners have pushed the soil, the rest of it back off the soil. But that just gives you a shot of a successful field of the farm. But the soils are, the, uh, we stay warm in the winters, the residue rots, it, it, goes, it disappears, it doesn't turn into organic matter. We, our, our grain handling facility is an important part of the farm. And a big part of that is we like to harvest our wheat early to, to maintain the wheat quality as well as 
get it ahead of any diseases that we might have. We use stripper headers. I don't know how many of you are familiar with those, but the stripper headers is opposed to like a draper or a conventional combine platform. It rotates on a drum about 800 RPMs. It has fingers that just literally jerks the, the head of the wheat off. So really you're not, you're, you're not putting much straw through the combine. And, and it makes a lot better place to, to, to plant your soybeans into. <laughs> So you can see kind of what a stripper head looks like there. And as soon as we harvest the, the small grains, we come in and, I mean, same, we'd like to have the planters in the field the same, the same time the combines are, we, we want. And that's important, it's also important we start, we start harvesting our wheat, uh, 18, 20% moisture, because we want to get it out of fields early, get our soybeans planted, and maintain the wheat quality. But stripper heads are really good. We have some logic, you can see this picture, that, that uh, cylinder that's rotating at 800 RPMs is actually kind of like a vacuum. You have so much suction pulling this stuff up off the ground that um, it does a really good job of, of getting lodged for it too. That's just a picture of the combines of harvesting dumping into the, the grain carts. And this is uh, this is no-till corn planted planted into uh, field where we had no-till wheat followed by no-till soybeans. The area we farm into Kentucky is uh, it's probably at least 90% uh, no-till all three crops that we grow. And that's a just a tram line through through our wheat where you can see we been through the spring probably fungicides here. And this is a soybean crop planted into the, the wheat sow after double crop. So that's that sort of gives you a, a shot at what the what the farm if the area looks like well where we farm. So a while back, there was an old farmer walking down the street with a young farmer and pointed to a $100 bill line on the sidewalk. The young farmer says, why don't we pick up that $100 bill? And the old farmer says, well, nonsense. If it were real, somebody would already picked it up. So my point is, a lot of times when we look at things in farming, we see opportunities right in front of us. We say, oh, well, that won't work. Well, sometimes they will work. So as I've shown with my slides, the, the southern tier of Kentucky has, a, has predominantly hard soils, which means we have limestone bedrock. The same latitude as Oklahoma and Kansas, they make for an environment that's well adapted to soft red wheat or the other zero grains, because we have good rainfall from October to June when we harvest it. So that, that's really a pretty good climate to grow, grow all cereal grains. In 1962, Shirley Phillips was a University of Kentucky agronomy extension specialist. And there was a farmer named Harry Young who lived about 40 miles west of us. They began experimenting with, with no-till corn planted into fescue sod. Kentucky claims these were the first two guys that planted no-till. I realize every state you go to makes the same claim with somebody else, but that's the story of Kentucky. But they actually started working with Alex Chalmers, and I'm pretty sure they were the first people that made it a fluted culture. And they took a disc blade and heated it up, beat it out on the anvil, and sort of made a fluted culture. And that's where, that's, I think really that is where no-till corn started being produced. It didn't work very well until we started getting some herbicides in the late 60s that we could, we could use to control grasses and weeds. But the first place we, that no-till really took off in Kentucky in the late 1960s, we were planting double crop beans into wheat stubble. Because it was really in the late 1960s that we started growing soybeans in Kentucky. And we understood the importance of, of planting quickly as soon as we'd harvest the wheat. So that was just a natural to develop the no-till system. 
many pieces of a puzzle came together in the 1970s and 1980s. No-till on a large scale was, like I said, was first used to plant soybeans. But Johnson grass, which was a Palmer amaranth of, of my early days, was a huge problem in corn. And there's really no way to control Johnson grass in Kentucky without tillage. And, and it, you didn't really control it at that point, but you at least knocked it back a little bit. But it really wasn't until Roundup was re released in the mid-1970s that no-till corn became a reality in Kentucky. So at that point, we had no-till soybeans that we were double cropping with, and we had no-till corn that was gaining more acreage. There's a lot of history to talk about wheat production in Kentucky, but really wheat, wheat in Kentucky is just part of a system or a process. And we don't look at it as we're gonna be wheat farmers. What we are is really we're farmers and wheat's just part of the program. It doesn't stand alone. By the early 1980s, we had no-till corn, conventional wheat, no-till some soybeans. And then we had a, uh, the first product that came out that would control Johnson grass and soybeans. It's called Post. And that, then, the, then we had fuselage shortly after. At that point in time, we could control Johnson grass in the no-till soybeans and that made the whole program a lot more possible. The big leap forward in, in Kentucky of wheat production was in, the, was in 1982. We had, a, we had an agronomy extension agent named Dick Stuckey, and he planted a variety of wheat called Tyler, which had exceptional yield ability. And he, but it was very, it had almost no resistance to leaf rust. But Dick sprayed diethane on this tile, variety of tiler at the right time, the right growth stage. And he made 99 bushels an acre of wheat in 1982. And that was big news in Kentucky because up until that time, our state average yield had been around 40 bushels an acre. So if you could grow, all of a sudden we thought, 99 bushels of wheat's a pretty good deal. We can learn to do this. So we started, started looking around, and the, the best research we could find in the southeast was occurring at Virginia Tech. And at that time, there were two young wheat researchers there, named Dan Brand and Mark Alley. And Dan and Mark had, had kind of come, found out that you know, we could grow wheat a little bit better than we've been doing. And they've been corresponding with some research people in England and, and Europe on intensive cultivation of wheat that was going on in, in Europe at the time was really driven by the absurdly high prices that the EU had, had set for wheat. I mean, at the time we were getting two and three dollars for wheat, they were getting 10 or 12 bushels an acre for wheat, dollars per bushel. So with the prices they were getting, that really produced a lot of research to increase their yield. So, at that point in time, we had one of our neighbors, Billy Joe Miles, organized a trip for about 20 farmers to visit England. And I, I know talking earlier, several people in the room had talked to Phil Needham. Phil was actually, fits into this whole story with uh, Billy Joe also. But, so these 20, these 20 farmers, we went to England in 1986. After spending a few days with English wheat farmers, we were totally embarrassed about our lack of knowledge about growing wheat. It's like a Kentucky farmer coming to Iowa and talking about growing corn. They were telling us about a much more intensive system of growing wheat, basically based, based on what happened at what growth stage of the wheat plant. And we were unaware of even that wheat plants even had growth stages. We soon realized we were not going to learn what we needed to know with just a quick visit. So while we were over there on the tour bus, we said, you know, this, this is, we need to hire an English urbanist to come back to Kentucky and work with us. So there were half a dozen of us that, that uh, found an agronomist while we were on that trip that was willing to, to talk to us about coming to Kentucky. And so we made, that, that was our 
goal for 1986 on. One of the best things, we, I, I'm sure this is maybe a common phrase, but I never heard it before we were in England. One of the English farmers told us that the best fertilizer were the footsteps of the farmer in the field. And, and really I think that is, that is a takeaway thought. It, there's, there's no substitute for, for scouting your fields and doing it yourself. If you hire, hiring scouts or buying a drone, it's not the same thing as logging your fields. You need to spend some time in your own fields. <coughs> so by the fall of 1986, we hired a agronomist to come to Kentucky named Chris Foley. At this point, our state average yields had never exceeded 40 bushels an acre. And except for one terrible freezing event in the spring, it's never been less than 40 bushels since 19, 1986. So we made serious, we made serious headway. But to understand how to grow wheat, there are three things you gotta know. What the, the yield components of wheat. It's a hedge per acre, the kernels per head, it's the weight per kernel. Those are only thing, three things you really know about growing wheat. If you understand how to improve those three components, you can grow good wheat. Another thing, another thing about wheat is, the world record yields in New Zealand for growing wheat are over 400 bushels an acre. So you gotta think, when, you, when the seed is in the bag, it's got the genetic potential to make 400 bushels an acre. And there's nothing a farmer's going to do to increase that genetic yield potential. The only thing, you can, the only thing we can do as farmers is to protect those genetic abilities as much as possible. So to do that, a farmer needs to provide plant nutrition, precision planting, weed control, prevent insects, control diseases, prevent lodging, and select the right variety for his location. And you have to do all of that at the right growth stage for each one of those things. No problem, right? Just simple. But then you gotta do it sustainably too, so that you don't get nutrient runoff, you don't get soil erosion, and you preserve your farm for the next generation. So that was our task as we moved into the late 1980s. In 1990, we knew we could still up our game because we, we had the ability to grow better wheat than we were doing at that time. So in 1991, we organized a small group of wheat farmers to focus on increasing Kentucky wheat yields. And early on, we said that's the only thing we're going to focus on. We're not going to, we're not going to get carried away and try to expand the global markets, and we're not going to build an infrastructure that uses up a lot of our money on, on you know, management and organization. We're, we're, gonna, we're gonna try to create a checkoff fund, and we're gonna try to increase, the sole thing we're gonna look at is increasing wheat yields, and our idea was at the same time that meant profitability. So we hired a lawyer to write a bill that we could submit to the Kentucky legislature, and we created a checkoff system in Kentucky where we check off a quarter of a cent a bushel that comes back to our, to our, our organization. <clears throat> in the early years, we'd self-funded our meetings and, and just kind of out-of-pocket expenses. So all of us, and we kind of had a blurred vision. If we had a vision at all, it was blurred. But now that we had some funding, we had the opportunity to get a little bit more focused on, on what we were going to try to accomplish. So we had a partnership that was based on the farmers, our land grant university, which in Kentucky is the University of Kentucky, and industry. Now early on, when we talked about having an industry representative on our board, there was, this, there was a commitment that we wanted a, a person from the flour milling industry. We didn't want an input supplier trying to sell us something. We wanted our customer on our board. And I think that's been a very beneficial discussion that we've had throughout our organization's life. The target that our group has is that 75% of our funds go to wheat 
increasing wheat yields and to research on wheat yields. And we made a decision to focus on results that we could measure. And this meant basically what a, keeping a graph of what wheat yields in Kentucky do compared to surrounding states of Kentucky. Are we gaining yield at a greater rate than our surrounding states? So that became our benchmark. We only meet twice a year. We meet in the spring to set research goals and, and, and issue a request for proposals to, and, and those requests for proposals are open to anybody. Any land grant that has a program, that, something that's interesting that they would like to look at, any private individual, private consultants, it's, it's wide open. If anybody has a, has a proposal to make to, to uh, Kentucky small grain growers and how to increase our yields, we want to hear about it. Then in August, we meet and uh, we go through the proposals that have been given to us. But not only do we go through the proposals, everybody that we sort of have a pre qualifying conference call. Everybody that's been approved to make a presentation and to actually go through the rest of the process can come and make a presentation to our board. And that has turned into one of the best things that our group has done. Because it's the opportunity, everybody that's interested in growing in wheat production in Kentucky sits in a room for a day or a day and a half. And we develop friendships and relationships with research people, other farmers, uh, flour millers, uh, and, a and a little bit of interest in distillers that are using wheat in the bourbon industry. So the camaraderie that's developed over the last 30 years because of this meeting is, is, a, is a, what a, it's kind of a, you can't verify what the benefit's been, but having somebody that you can call up and talk to about a problem is, is worth a lot. Kentucky harvests about 500,000 acres of wheat annually. And we generate two to $300,000 in checkoff funds. This, uh, over time, we, we put about $3 million in, back into Kentucky research. But we think that everybody that's participated has, it's, it's looked at as a matching grant. So if we put $300,000 a year into wheat research in Kentucky, we think that the group that's asked for the funding matches that. So we think we're generating somewhere around $500,000 annually devoted to increasing wheat yields in Kentucky. Just a side note about wheat production. The court gets a lot of PR about uh, the great yield increases that have happened. But over, globally, over the last 40 years, wheat yields have increased slightly faster than corn yields. And that's, what do you, which is kind of a, May not be true in Iowa but, Iowa, but if you look at it globally, wheat yields are pretty, are kind of on par with the gain of corn yields. But the results of our research in Kentucky are that we have an 87 percent increase in wheat production over the last 25 years, and the Kentucky wheat yield rate of increase exceeds all of our surrounding states. The creation of a wheat science team at the University of Kentucky was another milestone. Rather than individual researchers that were looking at their own interests like plant pathology or genetics or weed control, we now have a team at the University of Kentucky that's called a wheat science team. They collaborate on the issues and they talk, they talk to each other. And that may be one of our most significant accomplishments. It's really recognized as a go-to team wheat east of the Mississippi. In fact, we've had people from Kansas call us up and ask questions, which is kind of a, we're kind of glad to hear that, get that call. But the, the, another part of this wheat science team is that we, we really have an interesting developing graduate students because most of us that are on this week part of this week's science team have about as much gray hair as I do. So
So if we're going to continue this work, we got to look. We got to we got to encourage graduate students to be part of the program. And one of the things that uh, the our wheat growers organization has done, we just funded two hundred fifty thousand dollars in graduate student housing at the University of Kentucky because we want to encourage graduate students to come to Kentucky. We want to have a place for them to live. And we want to have a better place to live in Kentucky than if they go to Purdue. Because we think that's a way we're going to encourage people to, to come to Kentucky and look at our problems. In the early years, our organization kind of had a shot, shotgun approach on proposals. In, 1980, in 1992, we decided we needed a more targeted approach. So in that year, we asked Lloyd Murdoch, who is one of our real, one of the best soil scientists Kentucky's ever had, and Mark Alley from Virginia Tech, to spend a year looking at what are the potential ways you can increase yield, yields in Kentucky or increase wheat profitability in Kentucky. So they came back a year later with a proposal saying this is the way this is the best work you could do to increase wheat profitability in Kentucky. They came back and said, what you need to do is increase no till the acres of no-till wheat in Kentucky. Because they go back to the two, we have these two to six percent slopes. We get 50, 60 inches of rainfall a year. We get a lot of soil erosion. You know, no-till has a place in Kentucky. And at, the, at this point in time, we were no-tilling soybeans and no-tilling corn, but we were still conventionally planting wheat. Because most of our wheat's planted behind corn, and it's always difficult to get a good stand of wheat planted in your corn stalks. But in 1992, we said, okay, so our request for proposals in the future are gonna say, how do we develop? Is there a genetic variety that does better in the no-till system? Which when you think about it, you have warm soil in a no-till system. The soils stay warmer in the fall, they stay colder in the spring. So some varieties of wheat are going to do better in those conditions than in a, in a conventional system. So we started looking, going to a no-till system impacts everything we're doing as far as growing wheat. We have different genetics, we have different we have different weeds weed that grow in the no-till system. We have four diseases that come through. There's a moving to no-till is an entirely different environment than, than a conventional planted seedbed. But going to a no-till system also helped our water quality, reduced our runoff, reduced our soil erosion, and it had a lot of positive benefits. It changed the soil structure because we're going to a continuous no-till system. And I, I'm kind of under the idea that maybe this was, we weren't thinking about cover crops when we did, we did this, but it sort of had the impact that, that we're talking about with cover crops now. Because when we went to a complete no-till system, we, the soil particles got, we had larger aggregates, and we had more medium-sized pores, that instead of having the runoff that we had in the past, our soil actually absorbed a lot of, this, a lot of the rainfall. It hit, it hit the residue, it absorbed the impact of the raindrops, and it seeped into our soils. And, and, and our moisture holding ability in Kentucky soils is always it's, it's a big factor in any of all our yields. So we've done this for 16 years now, and we know that on Kentucky soils and in the two-year rotation of corn, wheat, double crop, soybeans, we expect the yields on our wheat are equal to conventional tillage. When you think about it, that's pretty reasonable because moisture is never a problem in the, in the growing season on the wheat crop in Kentucky. There's no benefit to holding more moisture. So you don't really expect to get better yields. Well, we found out that the following crops of corn, over time, over a 16 year period, we got a 3.5% yield increase in corn yields. And we got a 5.4% increase in soybeans. 
in the continuous nodule system. And if you look at, at uh, $4 corn and $10 soybeans over a two year rotation, we reduced our, we reduced our cost because no till is cheaper than conventional tillage. We reduced the runoff, increased the water quality, and we increased our revenue by $47 an acre by going to continuous no till. At this point, Kentucky's progress in wheat production had become noticed, and when the Seymour Building Company made a decision to build a new state-of-the-art flour mill, they looked at several states. And Kentucky wheat growers recruited this company from Illinois pretty hard. We secured state incentives to build, to bring them into the state, and we assured them that we were a dedicated group of farmers that wanted to produce wheat for them. So at this point, Seymour Milling uses about 50% of all the wheat that's grown in Kentucky. And it really came because of our wheat growers group that could, could supply them with a good crop of soft red winter wheat. So, my job as a farmer is to efficiently and sustainably grow plants that turn solar energy into starch and protein. So that's really the way we look at this, it's a process of a crop rotation that takes solar energy and turns it into, a, into starch and protein. Thank you.